Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The word of our God that we wish to contemplate for this morning is found recorded for us in the book of Ecclesiastes, highlighted for you chapter 1, verse 2, but in essence we'll be contemplating all of what Ecclesiastes truly says. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. Thus far, God's word, let you and I continue with prayer. O gracious and merciful Father, we thank you for the wisdom you share with us in your holy word. We thank you, dear Lord, for helping us to grasp that this life is not the measure of anything. This life is but fleeting. It's flowers that fade and grass that withers. But with you on our side, dear Lord, there is eternal life. There is the wonder and marvel of what this life is all about. There is the true measure. May we grasp that and understand that in Christ there is meaning. Amen. Well, considering all that's going on in the world, when I finally sat down and looked at this particular text and saw what it was going to be, I was, I was excited that it was this particular text that I was going to get to preach on. Now I know that many consider the book of Ecclesiastes to be a frustrating and, if you would, a quite negative book, but really it's not. Let me give you some, some background on this particular book. Ecclesiastes was in all probability written by Solomon Yes, the son of David, the king of united Israel. Although the author's name is not specifically mentioned in the book, there are numerous verses that clearly point to Solomon as the writer. Honestly, just that alone, that Solomon wrote this book, just that alone makes me want to pay attention to what is said. After all, you remember the history of Solomon, don't you? Remember how Solomon was finally given the kingship and that the Lord appeared to him and told him he could ask for whatever he wanted. And Solomon, in wonderful humility, asked the Lord for wisdom that he might properly guide God's people. And the Lord was so pleased that he not only gave Solomon wisdom, lots of wisdom, but pretty much everything else a king could want. Now, about the only hitch to this history so about all, you know, is that many people consider that Solomon, in his latter years, led astray by his many wives, ended up giving worship to false gods and ended up being an unbeliever. Now while I do believe that there was a period when Solomon's faith was weak or maybe when Solomon's faith was even non-existent, if you grasp that Ecclesiastes is Solomon's last testament of faith, you then begin to realize the importance of this book. So just think about that. Solomon grasped and knew everything. Solomon experienced the height in this world of everything. But in the end, Solomon in this world realized just one thing. And that one thing is pointed to by the theme of the book and by the very theme of this sermon. Our theme Meaningless. Everything is meaningless. Now again, I want you to grasp and remember who Solomon was. Here are a few verses of 1 Kings to help you grasp Solomon. When the queen of Sheba came to visit Solomon to test his wisdom, she is recorded as saying this. The report I heard in my own country about your achievements and your wisdom is true. But I did not believe these things until I came and saw with my own eyes. Indeed, not even half was told me. In wisdom and wealth, you have far exceeded the report I heard. In the same chapter, verse 23, we hear these words recorded by the Holy Spirit. King Solomon was greater in riches and wisdom than all the other kings of the earth. You see, those are just a, a few of the testimonies about Solomon. Of course, as I said before, Solomon in his old age was led astray from the Lord. And it was the Lord's judgment upon Solomon 
because of this weakness of faith or because of this period of, of, of a lack of faith that brought upon the people of Israel the split kingdoms that are going to occur right after Solomon dies? It's clear the Lord was not pleased with Solomon in his old age. And again, if we view Ecclesiastes as Solomon's last testament of faith, then please grasp that the book is no longer a negative and a disheartening thing, but rather this really is a, a book of comfort and hope. So let's you and I work at grasping this comfort and hope and make some modern day applications for ourselves. It is clear that the point of this great work found in scripture is highlighted by the words of our chosen text. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher, utterly meaningless, everything is meaningless. Now, the teacher goes on in this work and he explains exactly what he means. It's a wonder to read the book. When you read the entirety of the book of Ecclesiastes, here's what you conclude. Work, labor, wisdom, pleasures, advancement, riches, and just about everything else in this world is simply called meaningless by the author. And that's exactly what he means. Well, actually, the Hebrew word here is a word that means vapor or breath, and the author then says, vapor of vapors. We understand that he means, he, he means to speak about something that you can't hold on to, you can't grasp it, you can't see it, you can't measure it. It's, it there, there's nothing. And that's how we get that, that understanding of it's meaningless. Please bear in mind that the author, Solomon, intends to proclaim everything in this world. Everything in this world meaningless. And why not? Don't we proclaim in our nifty little proverbs things like this? You can't take it with you. Or how about that other little proverb? Time flies. Think about what they really mean. See, those ideas are really the same as what Solomon wants you to grasp about this world. Name one thing Name one thing that you have or name one thing that you could have that ultimately and finally will not rot, rust, decay, fade, spoil, or perish. For the past week, I've been trying to revamp my truck. Kind of took a close look at it and realized, oh, I need some new shocks and I need some new fluids and I need to cover up the rust. Why? Because it's rotten before my very eyes. Yep. Truth of the matter is, dear people, everything we have, everything we have is subject to the list of those things that will fail. And when you think of life in that way, when you think about the world in that way, you then realize what Solomon realized. It is meaningless. Now remember, Solomon had been given the greatest wisdom of God. Yet here is what he said as he contemplated the worldly side of wisdom. <coughs> I devoted myself to study and to explore by wisdom all that is done under heaven. What a heavy burden God has laid on men. I have seen all the things that are done under the sun. All of them are meaningless, a chasing after the wind. See, those words remind us of the burden of wisdom in our world. And sometimes the, the problems that we wrestle with. We think we know something, but really we don't. You and I have a tendency to think we have insight and grasp. We think we can't be swayed or manipulated because, well, we've got our feet on the ground. But in reality, you and I are sinking. We have this burden, this, this thing that we call wisdom. But in many cases, if we're not careful, we'll recognize it's just worldly and foolish wisdom. And then in truth, we, we don't grasp. We don't see. We don't have even half a clue as to the full and awesome knowledge and wisdom of the Lord. And the worst thing is that sometime our, sometimes our wisdom, our worldly wisdom, that human view of things leads us away from the Lord. You see, I believe that's why the author, Solomon, states that wisdom, worldly wisdom, is such a burden upon men. He knew firsthand how 
what he thought he knew could lead you away from the Lord. And I simply thank the Lord God that Solomon was led back. Now why do I say that Solomon was led back? Because basically the book of Ecclesiastes, as you continue to read it, tells us that without God and his truth, without God and his guidance, then truly this life and this world is meaningless. I want you to think about it. If the only thing about life is that you live, you then die, and that's it, well then, what's the point? Think about that. Why are you concerned about anything? Now? Why do we care about any rules or any this or any that? You live, you die, that's it. I guess you might as well eat, drink, and be merry, huh? Shall we declare, well, life is really about wealth. Well, when you die, the truth of the matter is, as you find in the book of Ecclesiastes, that that wealth is going to go to someone else. And who knows whether he's going to be wise or a fool. Or maybe you'll think to yourself, well, I, I, I want to gain some fame. I got news for you. Most who die in this world are forgotten within a few generations, if not a couple of years. Or perhaps you want to you live your life so that you leave some sort of legacy. Well, finally and ultimately, once you're dead, who cares? And then maybe, maybe you come across the idea or the thought, well, I'll become an author. An author. And when I become an author, there, my words will be recorded forever. Do you know how many authors there have been in this world who have come and gone and nobody knows who they are and nobody reads what they wrote anymore? You see, as you just begin to contemplate all these things, you begin to grasp what Solomon says is true. It's meaningless. This world and what it offers is meaningless. Ultimately, there is God and his truth. The God who promises that there is a life after this one, an eternal life. But I always have to say, please beware. God tells us that there are two eternal destinations and neither one of them is going to be meaningless. God in Jesus gives us eternal life and salvation. That's right. And eternity, get that word, eternity in heaven, living with him in joy and perfection forever. And there will never be a dull moment. Not in heaven. You will never have to worry about leaving something behind because it is a life that never ends. And it is called in scripture, the true life. And in reality, we can say something similar when it comes down to damnation. And eternity in darkness and horror where there is forever weeping and gnashing of teeth. And it will never end. It will never be good. It will never be meaningless there. For every second you will be wrapped up in the horror of why you are there. And it is called eternal death. Please note that God in his grace and love has made it possible to get to heaven just because of what his son Jesus has done for us. Jesus has died for our sins. Jesus rose from the dead. And just because, just because you believe in Jesus, you believe Jesus, you know, that what Jesus did for you is true, you have eternal life. That's God's gift to us. That's how God makes our lives relevant and worthwhile. He promises eternal life with him. He promises to forgive and overlook our faults. And boy, we've got them. He promises to pardon us just for the sake of Jesus. God promises us heaven. So for all who pass through this life in Jesus, there is heaven's eternity. And that promise and that hope of heaven impacts us right now. See, it is God's promise that gives hope and comfort even now. It is this grasp, this, this knowledge, this wisdom and truth of God that Solomon tells us 
is the only thing that is not meaningless, but it is meaningful. Our life in God. Our life in Christ. Forgiveness of sins. Eternal life and salvation. That is what gives meaning and purpose, hope and comfort, promise and deliverance for our souls. Now, let's just take the words of Ecclesiastes and the wisdom it gives to us and let's just make some applications, well, some interesting applications about this eternal truth of Solomon. We are in an election year. What a time we are having, huh? Most people would agree that the choice we have before us this year or during this election year seems to be between the lesser of two evils. That isn't that sad to say? It seems that our choice is the lesser of two evils and now you and I have to try and figure out which is which. And we have to admit it's been a negative campaign, probably the worst we've ever seen. And depending, depending on which side of the media you follow, this election year is either going to save or destroy our nation. Dear people, this is meaningless. Do we forget that God is in control? And that God will see to it that the person he wants in our high office is going to be there? It's not my job to tell you who to vote for, but it is my job to tell you you need to study the issues, you need to weigh and measure, and finally you need to vote your conscience in the Lord. That's our job. To take care of our citizen responsibilities in this nation of ours. To go out and vote. How you vote? Don't care. Just vote your conscience in the Lord. That's our job according to God's word. But recognize that in truth, it is all and always has been in the hand of the Lord. If God wants this country to be destroyed, that's his business. And if God wants this country to be saved, that's his business. What God ultimately decides to do is his call. And dear people, so it is. Haven't you ever noticed in the world countries come and go, nations rise and fall, and it's all in the hands of the Lord our God and His awesome goodness for the souls that are His. You do your job as God's child and He will do His. So you've been to the doctor and you've got news. It's a disease. And you are going to die. Well, who isn't going to die? Your job, even in the midst of difficulty and trials, is to trust in the Lord our God. If he desires to call you out of this world in whatever way he wants to, praise the Lord. Because in truth, you are going to heaven. You are going to inherit eternal life and salvation. Now. You may have to decide how best to handle what meds to take, how best to handle what kind of treatments I should do, how best to handle what kind of surgery should I have, and so forth. But as a child of God, please do so with the praise and glory of God on your lips and heart. Now, you can be like the meaningless world and crab and whine about it all, or you can be God's light in this world. Because you see, one has meaning eternally, and the other does not. By the way, I'll mention this because I know many of you are on Facebook. The other day on Facebook this past week, there was a little ditty that, that was uh, uh, sent around that was uh, about uh, grief, an explanation about grief. And uh, the explanation said something, you know, it's like 100 foot waves crashing over you, and eventually it becomes 80 foot waves, and then 50 foot waves, and all that other stuff. And, and so many people, including many Christians, that I know said, oh, this is just wonderful, this is just awesome, and it, it was pretty interesting, I can say that. And while some of the elements of what were written were true, what is also true about what was written is that it was written without Christ. 
Dear people, the Christian's heart is always, always tempered and always strengthened by Christ. Because in Christ, if we lose a loved one, don't you forget that that loved one is still alive. Only they are with Christ. And don't you forget that we will see them again. You see, that hope and that promise of Christ changes the whole thing that that person wrote. And in many cases made what they said rather meaningless, worldly accurate, but still rather meaningless for the Christian. There are those in this world who would say, well, you know, the measure of life is really just love. We need to learn to love, someone will say. And then I have to sit back and go, oh, really? So whose idea of love shall we follow? Shall we follow the liberal's idea of love that says love and sex are the same thing? Hmm. Most of us here know that's not true. Or should we declare love, you know, should we declare that uh, what's love is what that, that, that other person who says, well, you know, it's, it's loveless to discipline your child in any way. They go, what? That's exactly the opposite of scripture. There are people, lots of them, in this world who will say about various issues, the most loving thing to do is to abort that child. The most loving thing to do is to ignore the law. The most loving thing to do is your own thing. Or I always laugh at this one. The most loving thing to do is be yourself. You know, I'm 61 years old, and I still haven't figured out what be yourself means. What, what is that? And it just goes on and on and on. What I'm trying to tell you is that love, the way the world promotes love, it's meaningless. But in Christ, the love of God brings eternal life and salvation. The love of God continues forever and ever and ever. God's love has meaning eternally. Name one problem you have that God can't handle. Name one difficulty where God is going to desert you or God is going to fail to give you his wisdom and his strength. You see, the, the truth of the matter is our biggest problem is often ourselves because we doubt. We fail to put into practice the wonder of God's truth. And so we let our lives become worldly. We let our lives become a measure of the world's wants or the world's hopes or the world's pleasures or the world's ideas. And then I have to sit back and say, how oh, meaningless. Let your life be of Christ. And then what is it that you have to fret about? What is it then that you have to be get, you know, get bent, bent out of shape about? Jesus has given eternal life. Jesus has conquered sin and death. Jesus has given us his holy word to guide and to help us along this treacherous path of life and the meaningless of life. Because as we learn in the book of Ecclesiastes, ultimately, in Jesus alone, there is meaning. May our Savior bless us with his wisdom, his love, his life, his truth that brings real meaning to our lives. In Christ, the world becomes meaningless. But, but finally, our, our goal is not this world. Finally, our goal is his life and his salvation. God bless you as you contemplate and you consider where your life is at. Amen.